Oh, there we are. Nice. Okay. So, apparently, I pulled the only early lunch slot. Anyway, um, welcome to the future is here, and uh, the idea uh, to do this talk came because um, a few days ago I again got a bill of materials on my desk that was, um, let's say, a little bit extreme. So I was thinking, why don't we talk about uh, how the changes in hardware over the last, what, four or five years have changed the whole landscape of cloud computing. So I've built cloud for many years. And this is um, basically what we were up against um, six, seven years ago. We had, first of all, dedicated compute and storage nodes. The reason why was that the storage nodes needed a lot of slots, two and a half inch slots for hard disks because the uh, performance of the hard disks was so poor that we needed lots of spindles to create enough IOPS to, to, to drive the cloud. We had exclusively uh, multi-CPU nodes, um, typical Xeon E5 nodes. We had uh, relatively low core count because the, the CPUs were just so, free, so extremely expensive. We had, um, for instance, the top of the line CPU in 2016 was um, about $5,000 a piece. So you would have um, $10,000 alone in CPU in your node. We had low memory because of the, the cost of memory. And so it's essentially the cloud was relatively large and it, the performance was um, just adequate, to put it like that. So what has happened in the last few years in hardware? First of all, just for comparison, the biggest CPU that Intel sold in uh, in 2016 was a Xeon A5 V6, uh, a 2699 V4. Had 22 cores per CPU. For comparison, if you buy the hottest CPU that you can get on the market today, it has 96 cores for the CPU. So this is a four times the core count in the single CPU, plus the cores are two and a half, three times as fast as the cores used to be back then. Second thing is, memory prices went steep, on a steep decline since then. 256 gigabytes memory was a very well endowed compute node back, now, uh, back then. Nowadays, you have a compute nodes that have a terabyte, uh, one and a half terabytes and more. The only exception to this are the relatively new 128 gigabyte modules, which still cost about four times per, uh, uh, per gigabyte what the other modul modules cost. Then SATA SSDs, we all thought it was the future in uh, 2018, 2019. The prices were coming down, and they, uh, they have vanished, pretty much. If you buy uh, new compute nodes nowadays, most of them are equipped with NVMe, not, S not SATA SSD, because uh, SATA was essentially a disk protocol for a memory chip that you are trying to address. So this is really not such a good idea. And then finally, um, networking also became much faster. So now, if you imagine your old cloud from 2016, and you think about, OK, you had a number of workloads on it. You had, uh, let's say, 50 workloads on it. Now imagine a CPU that has four times as many cores, and each core is twice as fast as it used to be and you uh, try to condense your cloud to these nodes, what would happen? All of a sudden, you would have 500 workloads on a, on a single uh, node. And while this is kind of enticing, you could say, OK, I'm condensing my 100 node cloud into 10 nodes. The downside to that is that if one of those 10 nodes dies, you are going to be in deep trouble. So uh, what, we need, what we really need is an approach that, is, uh, that reduces the amount of cores per, per node. We don't want to just um, reduce the oversubscription because um, that would just um, waste the expensive CPUs that we stuff into there. And I want to show you an approach about this today. 
So this is again what we, what we were talking about here. This is um, the, the left one is uh, the hottest CPU that you could buy in 2016. And then for comparison, just take, t uh, take this and then the uh, column, the, the third column over. This is, um, it's literally five times as fast. You know benchmarks are not everything, but this gives you a pretty good picture of what these CPUs really can do. And then here, this one, uh, this one. Um, this is pretty, pretty much a, a, an entry-level CPU that you can buy, buy right now, and you can see it's still faster than the top-of-the-line CPU from back then. So, what can you mean? What can you do with all that? This was, um, we already talked about that. Let's get, uh, go right on to this. Um, so, one thing that you can do, and that I think you should consider when you're building a cloud build of, build of materials these days is to go from a dual CPU system to single CPU system. This has a number of advantages. First of all, you reduce the core count, you increase the node count to a reasonable level. But the, the big advantage to this is that uh, NUMA is a, lo a loose coupling between two CPUs in a system. And uh, when you have a NUMA system, you typically have uh, the hardware, network cards, storage devices attached to a CPU, but you cannot, have, you cannot guarantee that the code is also running on that CPU. So the data is coming in, coming in bouncing around between your CPU, uh, memory, CPU, storage device, and you're going back out. So you see a significant performance degradation. So what we can do is to say, okay, we are simply going to the system, one CPU, one memory PCI Express, and you will have no NUMA lag. And uh, one, U chassis, uh, one CPU chassis also are plentiful now. It used to be that most of the server chassis were two CPU. Nowadays, buying one CPU chassis is pretty commonplace. Looking at uh, memory, again, prices have come down. But uh, one thing that uh, really has uh, met my eye is that the customers tell me, we want to standardize on 128 gigabyte modules. So instead of putting uh, enough memories, uh, modules for all memory channels in there, they say, OK, we are just putting enough 128 gigabyte modules in there to, get our, to meet our performance target, or our memory target. So for compare this, these two scenarios. You can say, OK, we put four 128 gigabyte modules into the server for 512 gigabytes, or we can put 16 32 gigabyte modules in there. The one, this one, is going to be roughly four times the cost of this. And it's also going to be, uh, from a performance standpoint, much slower than uh, having the memory channels properly populated. Let's talk about memory channels for a second. This is also an important point. The CPUs from back then had four memory channels. Uh, uh, this, uh, the CPU I mentioned and all the smaller Intel CPUs, they all had four memory channels. So if you had, a had four memory modules on that CPU, then you would get the full throughput. If you are nowadays looking at the CPUs, you will see that Intel has gone to eight memory channels, which is part of the reasons why the CPUs have gotten so much faster, and AMD even went to 12 memory channels. So, but to get this speed, you act, uh, actually have to populate all memory channels, otherwise you will uh, throw away uh, memory bandwidth. So, uh, this is also, can be a little bit problematic. For instance, if you buy very small servers for, um, let's say, control plane purposes or so, um, 128 gigabyte modules with um, 12 memory channels, well, 12 memory channels will give you 192 gigabyte at the, at the very minimum. But uh, so you, can build, you cannot really build anything smaller than that anymore. Another thing that has also radically changed is uh, flash storage, or storage in general. We used to build Ceph servers with um, 20, uh, two and a half inch drives in a 2U chassis, and for SSDs for the, um, back then, the, the journal, later the block DB and the uh, write-ahead log. But the downside to that is that you are still 
at the speed of the hard disk. Even if you have uh, flash devices to um, catch the metadata operations, but uh, to write something or to read something, you're at the speed of the hard disk, and the hard disk can deliver maybe 100 IOPS, maybe 110, 115 under normal circumstances. If you go to complete flash, and I have done the math, math uh, here so you can compare this. If you go to complete, this, these are uh, prices from today, by the way. This is if you were to build a traditional server these days, you would look at about $10,000 for uh, 20 to, uh, two terabyte. Um, uh, for, uh, for, eight, for the eight two terabyte hard disks. If you were to build the same thing with SSD, it would be only a few hundred dollars more. And then the, the big surprise is that uh, NVMe uh, is even at the same price at, uh, these days. And NVMe is drastically faster than both SATA and uh, hard disks. Networking. We have for 25 gigabit Ethernet. Typically, I have customers who go to 100 gigabit. Typically, it's not really worth it. It is, um, it's just not worth the cost. It makes more sense to build smaller servers. If you, if you buy these, build these monstrosities with the high, hottest CPUs that you can find and everything, a 100 gigabyte network may potentially make sense because you might bottleneck on it. If you buy built normal sized uh, servers, you will find that the uh, 25 gigabit Ethernet is plenty for everything. So what would this, what would this look like? We could either build from entry level CPUs. We could um, basically use that um, Xeon uh, Silver 4314. That would, would give you pretty much the same cloud. This is about the same size, the same performance. And you would, have, would still have, a, let's say, a 100 node cloud. But this is what I lately recommend to everyone. Split the nodes in half. Use. Um, use single um, CPU systems, and uh, half the memory, half the storage devices, half, the, half everything. With this approach, you have twice the number of nodes uh, over the um, well, big guns. You have more resilience, you have more performance, less risk to get bottlenecks. But uh, most of all, if you are doing Converged and converged is all the rage these days for good reason. If you put NVMe devices in your system, you will find that this performs significantly better than a system with uh, two CPUs and half the cores. Simply because uh, you are elim eliminating the lag coming in through the network, going to the storage device, and, to, and, ba and back out through the network. Then you could also reduce oversubscription. But uh, this is something that I normally do not recommend. It's quite on the contrary. The new CPUs are much faster than the, the old CPUs. So oversubscription would normally actually go up. But uh, don't overdo it in either direction. Because if you go up too far, then you have uh, the same problem that I mentioned at the beginning, that you have too high of a workload density. If you're going down too far, you're throwing away money, uh, money for the CPU. So here, this is a direct comparison between a system with um, oh so, okay this is a direct comparison between a, a system that has two CPUs and a system that is exactly half of it with a, with a single CPU so uh, the you have instead of uh, the two CPUs, you have one CPU, half the memory, half the, um, the, the data storage devices, and everything. And you can see that the cost for those nodes is roughly half of what the, what the cost for the, uh, for the bigger nodes are. But uh, the system on the right, on the, this, this is, by the way, is cost per node, not for the whole system. But you know, what you can see is that the um, half system this will, you will have uh, twice the number of nodes, so half the impact if anything happens. You lose a node, you, uh, do, you lose half the storage, you lose half the, the workloads. And overall, the risk of encountering network bottlenecks or storage bottlenecks is significantly lower in the system with, uh, with twice the number of nodes. So, 
Yes, this is uh, the final stretch. I was asked by a company whether they whether we could upgrade their 2013 vintage uh, Xeon E5 V2 uh, clouds. I said, theoretically, yes. I mean, the systems are supported. The downside to this is that these the systems eat so much power compared to, you know, to modern systems that you literally, and I did the math for them, and it, it actually came out exactly like that, that uh, the uh, cost of the power alone pays over three years, pays your uh, entire new uh, greenfield solution. The other advantage of greenfielding, of course, is that you will have time to move all your workloads from one side to the other. If you try to upgrade, this is always the risk that uh, something does not work the way that you want to, that um, you get, get stuck and that you're spend, spending a lot of time and effort doing this. And then finally, of course, um, you have the two big points. Hard disks are obsolete. These had the, the, the systems that he had obviously had hard disks in that uh, 2013. There were no SSDs around, and uh, they were already bottlenecking on hard disk performance. And going to, an, to a new SSD system was drastically increased performance for this. And the other thing is, um, at some point, you know, the bathtub curve. At some point, you will simply have a point where the systems become so unreliable, especially hard disks, that you are starting to have cascading failures. And cascading failures, especially in distributed storage systems, are pretty problematic. So as final words, when you build a bill of materials, it's very important to consider all, aspe all aspects, not only okay, here I have my number of CPU cores, I have my number of memory, I have my capacity. Yes, we have to think about how does every um, choice that I make impact my environment. And I'm hoping that when you build this, you come up with something that is somewhere in the middle of the road, something that is not too small to have too much footprint and not too big to be too expensive, that you build something that uh, uh, has proper performance, reliability, and still uh, looks, uh, saves you some space in the data center and also some power. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, I brought a little bit of information to the table and uh, that you uh, take something home with you. And thanks for, for being the, a part of the Open Infra community. Uh, any questions? Yes? One question I had was when you were showing the comparison between two CPU and one CPU, how does uh, basically the power cost factor into the difference between the number of CPUs in a node and the higher density you get out of a dual CPU node? That's actually a very good question. So yes, the uh, one CPU systems will take a little bit more power. You will, of course, save uh, the, the big power consumers in the, in the system are the SSDs and the uh, memory and the, the CPU. But the main board does consume power. So your power consumption is going to be somewhat higher than it, is, than it would be with the two, uh, two CPU system. Uh, you have to, this is again an example that you have to balance your different parameters against what you have. For instance, if I had a data center, this is extremely cramped, and I simply cannot put more than a certain number of nodes, then I'll bite the bullet and build something that has a very high application density simply because I cannot build anything larger. But uh, it's not ideal, and um, so it, in the end, this is what we as uh, engineers and architects have to decide, how are we going to balance the uh, pros and cons of each solution. Do you have any insider experience with um, other architectures that have better power characteristics? I'm thinking of the Ampere Ultra, which is advertising an 80-core system with a very low power consumption relative to the comparable cores on Intel or AMD. So, uh, yes. Um 
we are looking into uh, uh, ARM-based servers. This is, um, I think, everyone who is uh, um, in the market at the moment does at some point. But uh, the problem that I see at the moment is that the software that is currently uh, built is still built for Intel CPUs. And uh, at the moment, for this generation, like if I was to build a data center right now, I would go with um, Intel slash AMD 64 CPU uh, architectures. I would bet that in four or five years, when I, if I hopefully maybe stand on the stage again, I can say, okay, we have the biggest shift in the, next, in the last five years has been the shift to extremely power efficient CPUs that have been, uh, that are perfect for the new, new type of cloud environments. But uh, so yes, the uh, AMD is coming, definitely. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for having me here.